It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel revelation. The giants of the underworld. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are so very glad that you've joined us again today. Um, you may remember that when we last left Ezekiel, we had been looking at some of the things in the underworld, trying to explain the organization of the underworld. Mm -hmm. And uh, you told me today that it's very important you're looking at this. As no, no, I'm just looking at you. Oh, oh. <laughs> You, you were saying this morning that you wanted to make sure that today we addressed the types of entities that are there. We yes. sort of talked about it a little bit, but it's hidden within the original language of Ezekiel, mm -hmm. what's really there. Yeah. Ezekiel was sort of giving us a geography of Sheol, which is interesting because it's the most detailed description we get of the underworld in the entire Bible, really. And what we find is that uh, very interestingly... There are, it appears to be a hierarchy of evil in the underworld. Well, it's not a surprise. No, no. It's uh, actually, as you pointed out last week, and correctly, a uh, reversal of what we see in, uh, in God's throne room and also in the temple and mm -hmm. uh, in the tabernacle, mm -hmm. where you've got a holy place, the holiest place in the center, mm -hmm. a holy place outside it, then a courtyard for... It's uh, a little bit less holy, and then you get to a garden and, and a lot of other places exactly. within that domain. Uh, the closer you get to the holiest place, the more holy it gets. Mm -hmm. Conversely, in the netherworld, it appears that the farther you get from the center of shale, the more unholy you get. And this was intended originally... As we read this as You would a, think it would be the other way around. You would think so, but uh, scholars say, no, it's, it's actually, it, it's, it's backwards from what we would sort of expect. Yeah. Um, but maybe not. I, you I would expect we'll the most evil, the biggest tyrant, the, the biggest rebel shale. to be in the center, and I would argue that it is. Well, we will we'll discuss this because there are a couple of ways of looking at this. Uh, because once we get past Ezekiel 32, the next week we're going to back up a chapter to Ezekiel 31 and address this. Now, the reason for Ezekiel 32 is a polemic against the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, mm -hmm. but he's comparing the Pharaoh with Assyria mm -hmm. and the king of Assyria. And we discussed this last week. Ezekiel was writing this no more than 25 or 30 years after the Assyrians had been destroyed by the Chaldeans who controlled Babylon. Yes. And I would also argue that only recently have scholars uncovered texts that not only give context to the polemic going on, mm -hmm. but also help to translate what is originally there yes. more yes. appropriately. Absolutely right. It's only been within the last 40 years that scholars have agreed that there was a cult that venerated the dead in and around ancient Israel, which is why we thought it was important to write our book before the most recent, Veneration. And we will draw on that book today as we discuss some of the deeper meanings of who exactly are these mighty chiefs who are in the midst of shale. So where do you want to begin? Well, let's start with Ezekiel 32, beginning at verse 20. Okay. And we did mention this last week. We did read this last week, but we'll go back and, and recover this again because there's a, a we, we often turn to the Septuagint translation, which was the Jewish translation made from older I should say, Jewish translation from older Hebrew text into Greek, mm -hmm. finished about 300 B.C. And we do not know what text they used because it's not been discovered yet. I'm praying that the Lord will uncover that for us one day soon. Absolutely. But what this does is gives us uh, an understanding of what the Jewish religious scholars in the Second Temple period, centuries before Jesus walked the earth, how they understood the Old Testament. 
So this this is a window into understanding here. Quick question. I'm looking at the Brenton, which mm -hmm. is the 19th century translation of the Septuagint. I have verse 19 omitted text. Was there a verse in the ESV or the original KJ yeah. or the... In the Masoretic text. So yeah. verse 19 in the English Bibles, which is drawn from the Masoretic Hebrew text, which was completed around 900 AD, mm -hmm. so more than a thousand years after the Septuagint translation and the older Hebrew texts that were used to translate that version. Ezekiel 32, 19 reads, Whom do you, surpa whom do you surpass in beauty? And this is uh, addressed to the king of Egypt. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down and be laid to rest with the uncircumcised. And the uncircumcised scholars argue, is a reference to those who are there, and we'll see more specifically here in just a moment, it's a mm -hmm. reference to the giants who walked the earth before the flood. Isn't that interesting that that's not in the Septuagint? Therefore, we have to assume that it was not in the uh, text that was used, whatever that text Correct. was. Correct. Mm -hmm. So verse 20 reads, They shall fall amid those who are slain by the sword. Egypt is delivered to the sword. Stop, stop. Who are those who were slain by the sword? You going to get to that in a minute? Um, well, yeah. Again, this is talking about the multitude of Egypt, which was referenced in verse 18. So the, a call Maybe. back to verse 18. Yes. They Maybe. shall <laughs> They shall fall amid those who are slain by the sword. Egypt is delivered to the sword. Drag her away in all her multitudes. The mighty chiefs shall speak of them with their helpers out of the midst of Sheol. And we talked about the helpers last week. But... Um, uh, here it reads, they have come down, they lie still, the uncircumcised slain by the sword. Now, th the reference here, the mighty chiefs, uh, as we wrote in the book Veneration, the term in Hebrew, Giborim Eli, can also be translated as the chiefs or the rulers of the Giborim, the mm -hmm. mighty men. And Giborim is the term that was applied to the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean Nephilim because it was also applied to David's bodyguard. Are you but going to read from the Septuagint? I was going to ask if you would do the honors I in verse 20 to. because verse, this is very illuminating. This is the Brenton, which again is free online. Um, and I get it at BibleHub.com. Biblehub Beginning with verse 20. They shall fall with him in the midst of them that are slain with the sword, and all his strength shall perish. The giants also shall say to thee, be thou in the depth of the pit, to whom art thou superior? Yea, go down and lie with the uncircumcised in the midst of them that are slain with the sword. That's why I asked in mm -hmm. verse 20, who are those who are slain with the sword? Yeah. Uh, They're not necessarily Egyptians. Well, no, because they do actually, Ezekiel does go through and list a number of nations that are in the pit who have been slain by the sword. And they may be spirit beings who uh, at one time had bodies. Yes, exactly. As we get the words, the giants also shall say to thee. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, similar to the uh, the declaration by the, the Rephaim in Isaiah 14 yes. when the rebel from Eden is cast down. How exactly. thou art fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Yeah. And uh, now you are weak as we with worms as your coverings and maggots for a bed. Uh -huh. Hey, but, look at uh, you. You're nothing now. Yeah. But remember last week we mentioned in Ezekiel 32, 18, son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt, send them down her and the daughters of majestic nations. But the word majestic is Adarim, which in a comparable Semitic language, Ugaritic, which is very similar to Hebrew. Yeah. Adarim means noble ones, which was a term that was applied to supernatural beings in the underworld. Yes. So we're dealing, that's the reason we're bringing this up this week, mm -hmm. because this is not necessarily just a polemic against the enemies of Israel. And just so you understand, Physical we're enemies. not seeing giants and spirit beings everywhere. <laughs> mm. There are times when it's very clear that the, uh, the entities of the, uh, the, the beings being discussed mm -hmm. are humans. But there are other times in the original language when I think it's better to assume that it's a spirit being. A exactly. Spirit. And the reference here to these mighty chiefs in the midst of Sheol suggests that they have pride of place, that they are somehow yes. distinct and fundamentally different from the run-of-the-mill human dead Yeah, in Sheol. I would argue that you are so correct, right. sir. So this context, of course, is a polemic over Pharaoh whose lands would soon be overrun by the Chaldean army led by Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, yeah. And uh, so for Bible commentators, it's, it's 
on a surface level translation or interpretation, it's correct to say, yes, this is a prophecy over uh, Egypt, that Egypt mm -hmm. is suddenly, is and in fact, Egypt was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar at uh, that battle in 606 BC where yes. the Assyrians were destroyed. Yes. So um, the Egyptians are described as going down to the pit to lie among the dead of Assyria, but as we see in um, uh, verse 22, Assyria is there and all her company, notice the feminine pronoun there, which is how nations were referred to in the collective. Well, except it's his. In the Septuagint. In oh. the Septuagint. Septuagint says, there are Ashur and all his company, You're right. all his slain have been laid there. That's really interesting because ah. that is a fundamental difference between the uh, Masoretic the Masoretic Hebrew text uses the feminine pronoun, mm -hmm. which is how nations were referred to in, in the collective, the mm -hmm. way we would refer to a ship as a with a feminine pronoun in yeah. English. But a singular, the, the reason this is really interesting and why we're going back to Ezekiel 31 next week, Asher was the name of the chief god of the Assyrians. And he was identical, identified with and equivalent to, I mean, same deity, different name, as Enlil, chief god of the Sumerians, Dagon, chief god of the Amorites who lived along the Euphrates River, and El, chief god of the Canaanites. He mm -hmm. was all the same god. And then later called Kronos and Saturn by the Greeks and Romans. Yes. So this is why, yeah, this yeah, is all... If you're all confused about that, Derek's writing a new book that will come out later this year that's all about that. Yeah, yeah. They just use different masks to different cultures. So, yes, that is really interesting. So... Asher is there, and different all his company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, one puppet master with mm -hmm. different finger puppets. Um, and all his company in the Septuagint, its graves all around it, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the uttermost parts of the pit. Mm -hmm. So contrary to these mighty chiefs, the Assyrians, or Asher, mm -hmm. but you know, given the context there, the graves all around it, all of them slain in the plural, may suggest a, the Assyrian soldiers, the Assyrian nation that was destroyed by the, 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 the Babylonians. Possibly, but you've also got warfare conducted by loyal and fallen angels against one another and also oh. fallen angels who fight amongst themselves. That opens up a whole nother dimension to Doesn't this. Doesn't it? Though? This is why Sharon writes the Red Wing Saga, Supernatural Fiction, and shows that these these supernatural entities aren't all aligned with one another, even as they are aligned against God. Yeah. Just as members of a certain political party may not all be friendly with one another, even though they may oppose the opposite political party. Mm -hmm. Same kind of maneuvering going on in the spirit realm. So here we potentially see, based on the Septuagint translation, the translation and the fact that in Ezekiel 31, Asher is mentioned with the masculine pronoun. Yes. Uh, we could see here a depiction of a war between the fallen, the chief god of Babylon, uh -huh. against the chief god of Marduk versus Asher, in a yes, sense. Yes, yes. What is uh, your verse 24? Verse 24, Elam is there, and all her multitude around her grave, all of them slain. This says, all there is Elam, and all his host round about his tomb. That's right. And I'm, I've got a newer translation of the Septuagint, but again, it's the masculine pronoun. Mm -hmm. And I would argue, that I've not done any research on this, so um, forgive me for not explaining further, but I would argue that if Ashur is an entity, that Elam is as well. The Prince of Persia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. the, the point here regarding these uncircumcised nations in the underworld, and, and all of these nations uh, that are mentioned, Elam, Meshach, Tubal, Edom, uh, the Sidonians or mm -hmm. the Phoenicians, and the princes of the north. That, yeah. uh, all of those essentially show up in Ezekiel 38 and 39 as part of the uh, coalition from the north in the exactly. war of God and, and Magog. And by the way, I don't think this has happened yet. If these are talking about spirit entities, because the prince of Persia is still in this it's world. still around, yes. Um, hmm. Hmm. Now, Ezekiel does say in Ezekiel 32 that uh, these are already in Sheol, Mm -hmm. and will greet the pharaoh of Egypt upon his arrival in the netherworld. But this is what's, what, what's interesting here, it, with going back to uh, the uh, Assyrians or to Asher, mm -hmm. uh, whose graves are set in the uttermost part of the pit, and her company is all around her grave, or his company is all around his grave. What verse are you on? That's verse 23. Fallen by the sword, who spread terror 
in the land of the living. Now, this word terror uh, in English doesn't really capture the Hebrew sense of the word. In, in, and I'm going to mangle this, the Hebrew pronunciation. It's ketith, I think, C-H-I-T-T-I-Y-T-H, ketith. In the Hebrew mind, that conveyed a supernatural fear like panic of the sort you would feel when you saw a ghost. Yes. Or a demon. Yes. And that's what is confronted here. They spread that kind of terror, Asher, if we're talking about this supernatural entity called El or Enlil or Dagon, mm -hmm. who in the book that I'm working on, I will equate with the chief of the watchers who descended to Mount Hermon, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, the sons of God who saw that the daughters of men were fair and created the Nephilim in the first place. This appears to me, when taken in context with Ezekiel 31, and great catch on the Septuagint pronouns. Well, uh, thank you. Um, by the way, you said a minute ago that these things had already happened. It's really difficult when you get a prophecy that says this has happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that this is not yet. Mm -hmm. It has not yet happened. And already, because but not yet. Because to the Lord, thing. all things are the same. Mm -hmm. and all time once is you, now. Exactly. It's, it's very difficult. So it gets very timey-wimey. So don't get bogged down in, in the idea that if it says it has happened, that it means it's in our past. Our time stream is different than God's. Yeah. Well, when we come back, I want to talk oh, about... Uh, time is... Yeah, it really, yeah, this Speaking is a fascinating topic. But uh, I want to jump down to verse 27, because there I think we get some confirmation that what we're talking about are spirit beings, uh -huh. and specifically the Nephilim uh -huh. of old. So we'll dive into that when Unraveling Revelation continues. With the official disclosure of UFOs moving full steam ahead, very few will be prepared for what is coming. The answers are now available in Josh Peck's groundbreaking new Skywatch Films documentary DVD, over 10 years in the making, entitled The Great Delusion, The Second Coming of Earth's Oldest Enemy, along with Dr. Thomas Horn's documentary-style expose on DVD, Rome and the Star God, and the late Chris Putnam's Vatican presentation on DVD, Astrobiology and the Vatican ET Connection. Josh Peck's new documentary, The Great Delusion reveals for the first time why the Vatican is in possession of a telescope named the Lucifer device, why the ancient and mysterious Anasazi suddenly disappeared from the historic record, how alien abductions might be connected to the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, whether there is a secret alien-human hybridization program being conducted on Earth right now. If there is a connection between aliens and supernatural entities such as demons and fallen angels and what we can do to prepare for what's ahead, you'll also see stunning reports on the UFO phenomenon by Dr. Thomas Horn, Josh Peck, L.A. Marzulli, Timothy Alberino, Nick Pope, Chris Putnam, Chuck Misler, and many more. You'll also receive Dr. Thomas Horn's documentary-style expose, Rome and the Star God, on DVD. Join Dr. Horn for this incredible expose on how the Vatican is not only willing to accept our alien brothers with open arms, but are actually enabling the arrival of the end-time star god, the Antichrist. But that's not all. We're also including the late Chris Putnam's shocking presentation entitled Astrobiology and the Vatican ET Connection on DVD detailing the Vatican's plans to baptize aliens upon their arrival and how contemporary societies will soon look to the aliens to be the saviors of humankind. Sold separately, these items have a retail value of $75. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling while supplies last. Prepare for full disclosure with the Great Delusion Special Offer. Available now at SkyWatchTVStore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. I've got my coffee mm. hot. Uh, we want to invite you to join us this year, 2021, in Israel. Mm. And we're going to go to Jordan as the extension. So it's October of 2021. You can go to skywatchinisrael.com for all of the details. It will take you to the Aaron Lipkin tour page. You'll see the prices there, when we leave, when we come back. Well, you can, you know arrange your own airfare if you want, or you can have him do it. We always just let him do it. He, uh, he gets the best deals. So if you want to go, 
Go to skywatchinisrael.com and see what you have to do to sign yes. up. By the way, we still don't know if they're going to require vaccination. Um, we're not inclined to want to go that route, but um, we'll give you more information as it comes along. And Aaron, is he's talking to us every week. Right, right. This is a very important, obviously, to him because it affects his livelihood. So he's paying very close attention to it. He and isn't. as we know more, we will pass it along to oh, you. Oh, yeah. And he's coming to visit this summer, so we're hoping to see him then. Yes. And when we go to Israel, we'll see some of these sites. We can say, okay, the prophecy of... Yes. Yeah. Ezekiel 38 and 39 will be fulfilled down there. Oh, and yeah. Psalm 68, that's up there. It's an yeah. entirely different tour of Israel. We'll see many of the, the sites that the other tours go on, but we'll go to places that nobody else goes to. Absolutely. Well, verse 27, um, and, and I know that we're just doing a thumbnail sketch <laughs> of this We have to continue chapter. next week. Yeah, we, we do. And uh, again, I want to get back to Ezekiel 31, because I think that sort of cements this whole idea as part of a whole. And then from there, we can show you why this is relevant to Revelation 9. Um, verse 27, Ezekiel 32, and they do not lie with the mighty. This is the ESV translation now. The fallen from among the uncircumcised who went down to Sheol with their weapons of war, whose swords were laid under their heads and whose iniquities are upon their bones for the terror of the mighty men was in the land of the living. Now, here's the reason this is so fascinating. There this are, is entirely different, by the way. Yes. Well, let's go ahead and read the Septuagint then. And they laid with the... the 27? Uh, yes. And they, they are laid with the giants that fell of old, who went down to Hades with their weapons of war, and they laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities were upon their bones, because they terrified all men during their life. Mm-hmm. So Ezekiel is saying that the power of these nations that he's named here, from Assyria, Elam, Meshach, Tubal, et cetera, et cetera, was that they had, crea they had caused terror in the land of the living. Isn't that in the interesting? Land of the living. Because the assumption is, and it may still be correct, but the assumption is that the Nephilim, the hybrids, were condemned because they were hybrids. Mm -hmm. This seems to imply it's because they've terrified the land of the living. Exactly right. Now, Ezekiel, like Isaiah in Isaiah 14, is mm -hmm. portraying these spirits as powerless to affect the living. The living. When, once they're in Sheol, they don't come back through those gates. Now, we do know that demons can inflict us, and those spirits of the Nephilim afflict us, is yes. what I meant. Yes, but they lack their bodies, and they right. long for their bodies, and they, they believe that they will be resurrected. Yes, yes. And that's what this whole war is about. Who actually gets resurrected mm -hmm. at the last trump? Uh, spoiler alert, it's us who <laughs> accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But here's the thing. Some scholars who read this verse in uh, Ezekiel 32, 27, the phrase is, um, Giborim Nophilim me olam, which literally means mighty fallen ones of old. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is an allusion to the giants of Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, the mighty ones, the mighty fallen ones of old. But there are scholars who believe that Nophilim is, contains a mispointed vowel. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Oh, I'm having to depend oh. on uh, Hebrew scholars who have come yeah, up with this. Because originally the consonants had no diacritical markings, and exactly. then later they, on they were put in to allow people to understand. Right, and that's why we look at the Septuagint, because the Septuagint translators... 300 years before Jesus, clearly understood Ezekiel to mean the giants. Yes. Not just mighty warriors, but actual giants, a reference to Genesis 6. But if you take the mispointed vowel from Nophilim and read it Nephilim, the verse becomes this. But they do not lie down with the mighty Nephilim of ancient times who went down to Sheol with their weapons of war, their swords placed under their heads, and their iniquities upon their bones, for the terror of the mighty ones was in the land of the living. Well, that goes along with the Septuagint because it says giants. Exactly. And that they terrified all men during their lives. So this change doesn't change the meaning of the verse. It just makes it plainer. It makes it plainer, exactly, when you understand that. Yes. So, By the way, verse 29 is really good. Well, go ahead. These are laid... The princes of Ashur, who yielded their strength to a wound of the sword, these are laid with the slain with them that go down to the pit. Now, the Nephilim, pre-flood, didn't die by the sword. No, they did not. Hmm. Hmm. 
They lie among the uncircumcised with those who are slain by the sword. So all of these nations that are mentioned here were mm -hmm. antagonistic toward Israel, at least to a degree. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, Elam, not so much, but these, uh, these the others. These nations, uh, well, Elam, in a way, because we're going to see that in the end times, Elam joins in Iran, right, Persia. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and th that was my point, was that historically speaking, Elam was one of the farther removed nations. and not, but right, right, but the assumption is all of this is past. Right. What if this has this? not yet all been fulfilled? Exactly, and I had not thought of that before ah. today. So, yeah, but clearly what Ezekiel is describing here in Ezekiel 32, and next week we'll go back to Ezekiel 31, and we'll make the case that uh, Assyria which is the same Hebrew word as Asher, the chief god of Assyria, uh, have been conflated. And that what we see when we look at those chapters, these two chapters together, is Ezekiel saying, this god, who was the chief god of the pantheon of the Assyrians, is now in the netherworld. Mm -hmm. And that he's joined by all of these uncircumcised nations that have dared to raise their sword against the people that God chose as his own. And center of Sheol, in the midst of all this mm -hmm. are the mighty fallen or the mighty Nephilim of old who are in the netherworld. Can I just say that if we can get our kids involved in this kind of study, that we can excite them about the Old Testament. Many kids will go ahead and read the New Testament. The Old Testament is boring. Mm -hmm. It's boring to a lot of adults. This is so much better than DC Comics or Marvel Comics or any graphic novel or any great movie that they've watched. We love The Lord of the Rings, but it's The Lord of the Rings on steroids. Because this is real. Because this is real. And when you help your kids and grandkids to understand what's really being discussed here, I think you're going to find their eyes getting really wide and getting all excited about it. Oh, absolutely. Oh, Mom, Grandma, can you tell me more? <laughs> absolutely. And then, and then take them to Job 41 and have them read the description of Leviathan, which is a dragon. A dragon. And by the way, they need to read your book, uh, Iron Dragons. Oh, <laughs> it is so good. If you've got a young reader, uh, what would you say the lower age around? 12, 11? Oh, maybe even 10. Yeah. Because I, I try to leave out anything. It's very family friendly, yeah. exactly, but it's exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, well, yeah, and you're right. The, the Bible, when we properly understand it, is the Lord of the Rings on steroids, mm -hmm. which is why our most recent book is called Giants, Gods, and Dragons, because they're all in here when we understand mm -hmm. it. And that's why when we bring out the Septuagint, it's to show that the Jewish scholars in the centuries before Jesus and the apostles walked the earth understood this. It's just we have lost it from our understanding because we have translated it out and we've got a, an anti-supernatural bias in the church that we need to overcome. We do, and I think that sadly the pastors have let us down. And it's not their fault necessarily so because they're trained, they're trained, they're trained that way, exactly. Yeah. So retrain your pastor. Yeah. Well, next week we'll talk about who exactly is Asher and why was Asher sent to the underworld and covered over with the deep. Oh, I know. This is going to be good stuff, so stay tuned. Mm, this is Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV.